And I want to thank the brothers here, the sisters, for the wonderful week that we've had so far. Sister Clara and I say amen to the proceedings thus far. You may want to turn to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. We'll read beginning with the 14th verse here in a moment. One fellow asked another one, what is the gospel? The other one said, it's bragging about Jesus. Now, on that basis, Hebrews has got a lot of gospel in it. I tell you, it brags about Jesus. I always love Philippians 3.3 3, when it talks about who a Christian is and what are the marks of them. Now, one of them right in there says, glory in the Lord Jesus. Now, on that basis, if you'll just take Hebrews, make it yours, you can glory in the Lord Jesus because that's what it does. Amen. Glory is in the Lord. You remember the other two marks there? That was right in the middle. You remember the other two marks? Worship God in the Spirit. Put no confidence in the flesh. <laughs> One guy asked me, how do you worship in the Spirit? I said, if you're glory in the Lord Jesus Christ, but no confidence in the flesh, you won't even need to ask me that question. Amen. <laughs> It'll just get you. If you can glory in the Lord. Now, that's the reason we're going to Hebrews. We want to glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. A great high priest... Well, one translation said passed through the heavens. One pass says passed into the heavens. Now, since I'm not a Greek scholar and I don't know, I accept them both because they're both true. He passed through the heavens, but he passed into heaven, so we don't have to worry too much about that. We want to focus on the fact that he was a great high priest. Now, it already been mentioned twice that he was our high priest before we got to the fourth chapter and the 14th verse. But in the next few chapters, it mentions him at least another dozen times. As a matter of fact, if you took out the chapters in which high priest was mentioned in Hebrews, it'd, it'd be a shorter book. <laughs> you know, like half its size. And it's already a short book. At least the writer of it said he spoke to us in a few words, wrote to us in a few words. And so the writer, now when you study it, <laughs> I've noted it's not too short. There's a, so much stuff in it, just so much. And actually from my point of view, there are some good commentaries on it. Brother Kevin, as a matter of fact, has written one. Read one, I don't know whether you, John Brown. Now, I know it's a rare name, but maybe you've <laughs> heard of it. John Brown wrote back to the 1700s. Beautiful, beautiful, uh, detailed book. It does glorify Jesus. Now, from this point on, I want to mention why he's great. Because Hebrews mentions why he's great. We want to establish that and then see what a great high priest does. Now, it mentions in Hebrews second chapter, he's merciful and faithful. 
You know, the Levitical priesthood, ordained of God, and appointed of God, and was able to do a lot of wonderful things and had a good reputation among the people, wasn't often all that merciful nor faithful. You know, it kind of got off really to a rocky start. But Jesus is great because he is merciful and faithful. Now, Hebrews, the third chapter, third, he's, got, he's a great because he's got more honor than Moses. Can you imagine looking at a Jewish person in the face and say, I got someone greater than Moses? Yeah, he's great because of that. It doesn't diminish Moses. It elevates Jesus. Uh, after all, Moses was faithful in all this God's house. Now, here it says he's a high priest that operates from heaven. I don't know of any other high priest that ever operated from heaven. So he, he's great in that sense. It, now, you know, if you kind of slap a Jewish person by putting someone over Moses, how about throwing in Abraham? He's greater than Abraham. He, he, Jesus? Greater? Yeah, I'm telling you, he's greater than Abraham because he's a priest like Melchizedek. Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. The Bible distinctly says that. So he's after that order, so he's greater than our father Abraham. And oh man, he, I, I love Abraham. Mm, 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 I'm a seed of his. But Jesus is great because he's greater than Abraham. He's a great high priest because his obedience was perfect. Uh, can you imagine the blood was shed by unobedient priest under the Levitical priesthood? You know, before they could offer for people, they had to clean themselves up. Jesus is great because his obedience was perfect. He's a great high priest because his office is secured with a promise and an oath even as the promises to Abraham was secured with a promise and an oath. Now, you know, that's two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Now, I know those two immutable things, that God made a promise, that's immutable, took an oath on it, that's immutable. But I want to tell you, there's two other immutable things. God swore to Abraham that in his seed would all the nations of earth be blessed. And he swore to Jesus, you're a, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now there's two other immutable things. So Jesus, that was never made a promise to any other priest. Of course, he's great because he is a king and a priest. Melchizedek was a king and a priest of Salem. <laughs> What's Jesus, king and priest of heaven and earth? He's king and priest of everything. So he's great in that sense. He's great because he lives forever. As a matter of fact, that's Hebrews 7, 16. He says, not only lives forever, he's got the power of life. Okay. Great because he is a high priest can bring humanity back to God. I'm not, don't know of any other high priest that is in that business. He can bring us back to God and we'll have more to say about that. He is a guarantee of a better covenant, says Hebrews 7 and 22, because he had only one offer, only one sacrifice for people for all time. What other priest could do that? He's great because of that. Great because he rules from God's right hand and the right hand of God has been shown to be the place of activity. Great because the work given to him as a high priest is greater work than was given to any other priest. That's Hebrews 8 and 6. Wonderful thought. Great because the covenant that he mediates is greater than any other. That's Again, 8 and 6. Great because he became a high priest of the good things that we now have. He entered the greater and the more perfect tent, not made with humans, not of this world, but the most holy place, heaven itself. That's Hebrews 11 and 9. Greater because the sacrifice of himself was the perfect sacrifice. That's 9, 14. Finally, a blood that will cleanse a conscience. 
No, I can't. I suspect this room wouldn't hold the blood that was shed that never cleansed a conscience. He's great because his blood once shed can give us that pure conscience. Amen. Great because he is appearing for us. Thank Amen. you, Brother Al. That gets it personal. Amen. And he'll continue there appearing for you until he comes back again to complete your salvation. So Hebrews 10, 21, we've gone from Hebrews 4 now to Hebrews 10, 21, just kind of a summary statement here. Since we have a great high priest over God's house, let us come near to God. Sincere heart and sure faith because we have been made free from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hold firmly to our profession because we can trust God to do what he promised and he promised and took oath. Jesus, you are a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the Levitical priesthood was efficacious in ceremonial cleansings, but inefficacious in moral cleansings, never relieving your conscience, never bringing you lasting peace. The work of our high priest can do that and more. Amen. So the will of God was fulfilled in Christ's offering once for all, and our justification, sanctification, expiating our sins, remitting our sins, quieting our conscience, purifying our heart, consecrating you to be a peculiar people. Most of that required a high priest. Of course, in his Justice was satisfied. Mercy had free course. This work given to Jesus as the incarnate word that he obeyed through his suffering then was given to him unlimited dominion and crowned with supreme honors. And one of those honors, you are a high priest. God raised him to the highest place, gave him a name which none is better, and made him a high priest. So then in summary we can say, and then we'll get some applications, Jesus is our great high priest, entered into heaven through his own blood, gone through the veil. He's done so bodily a high priest at the right hand of the majesty of heavens, consecrated that entrance for us yes, as a new and living way for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, made perfect through suffering, becoming the author of eternal salvation, appearing this moment, every moment, next moment, as a representative of you for us. And he will bring many sons to glory. Yes. It is secured that you're going to be like him or you shall see him as he is. He's going to change our vile bodies and make it like unto his glorious body by a new and living way we contrasted to Jewish people who dared not follow a high priest into the holy place or most holy place. You will follow Jesus. It's consecrated for you to go where he is, to heaven itself. So now, draw near in the full assurance of faith and hold fast, for he is faithful that promised. I swear and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Now God will not impose an oath on a matter that's trivial. That's right. Amen. You don't find many oaths in the Bible of God. Something important about a high priest. Now I'll just get my cart before the horse and tell you right fast. It didn't take all that long for him to justify you. 
I'll, I'll hit that again a little later. And it's not going to take long for him to glorify you. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. But I'm going to tell you, it's taken him 60 years working on me to sanctify me. And that's the high priest's job. That's right. Amen. Now let's think about this ascended Jesus through the heavens or into heaven being himself first constituted as the firstborn from the dead. So at this moment, Jesus of Nazareth is at the right hand of God as God's perfect man. There he is. Perfect in the realization of God's purpose for man. Perfect in the redemption of Adam's race. The arrival of Jesus at the right hand of God was a, an arrival that had never been seen before. Contrasted to others, Jesus arrived in the right of his own perfection. Oh, yes, there was those millions of angels <laughs> that accompanied him. But there wasn't no mediator that opened the door for him. Amen. He went on his own. In his own perfection, he stood unafraid in the light of God's holiness, giving perfect realization to that expression of God. Let us make man in our image. Here he is. A perfect man. Amen. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, O ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. Amen. The one in whom death had no claim wrought victory for others. He died the death of a sinner in the place of those who ought to die. For himself, he stood in the perfection of his manhood, God's perfect man. But for me, he is my perfect God. I wouldn't know anything about God except for Him. That's right. He's God's perfect man. He's my perfect God. In Him is a full and final revelation of God the Father. Amen. Apart from Him, I'm shut up to ignorance about God. Amen. And as my high priest and mediator, he represents me to God. He represents God to me. He mediates between God and me. He mediates between me and God. And matter of fact, he mediates between my old man and Adam and my new man and Jesus. And it doesn't take him long there just to crucify the old one <laughs> and be born again. Now I'm going to say a few words here that will be new to the conference, except in Brother Al's poem. Caught this. It's impossible for me when I consider the exalted Christ elevated to the highest of positions to not realize the wounds, the wounds that he bears. John's vision, a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. The perfect man did show me on earth the glory of God. The wounded personality shows me the father was wounded too. In redemption, 
through which grace was manifested and wrought a great victory. The Godhead was wounded. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. You don't think you can grieve the Holy Spirit? You don't think the Father can be grieved by your sin? And Proverbs says, the spirit of man will sustain his infirmity, but a broken spirit who can bear? I tell you what, our sins worked on the spirit of God. Yes, Jesus says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off my hair. I didn't hide my face from shame and spitting. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Now the wounding of the body was outward visible. But you don't think the wounding of the spirit was the deeper scar my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Now, Jesus is the revelation of God, right? Okay. Then, Jesus was a man of sorrows. Do you not think the Father also was a man of sorrows about my sin? Can Jesus shedding tears not tell you that all divinity has a tender heart for you? Pra praise God, the ascended, gone through the heavens, ruling and reigning and all power in heaven and earth, sitting in the dignity of the throne with perfect harmony with the Father. Jesus is still man's wounded God. That he can be a high priest that can be touched with my infirmities, who expresses God's consciousness of my weaknesses and sorrows. My comfort comes as I look at the throne and see among all of its splendor one who bears the marks of suffering, which was for me those marks that I might be brought back to union with joy and love. It's good to know when the work is long and the tears are flowing and the day is long in coming as the night lingers that your conflict is with a defeated foe there's no doubt about the outcome because my wounded God is watching, ordering, preventing, mediating, speaking, ruling, letting mercy operate in justice in my justification, sanctification, and glorification eventually as my high priest. I just... I want to back up here a minute and consider the nature and extent of the calamity which constituted the need for a high priest yes, amen. or for a need for a Christ. In that calamity in the garden which my brother spoke of, man was distanced from God by sin. <laughs> They even hid right there in the garden. <laughs> Wanting to get away from God. I tell you what, that's a great act of mercy that God gathered them up. Amen. Amen. Oh, that was the first act of grace. Is, well, an early act of grace, if not the first. Gathering them up. Because God didn't want to be around them either. He didn't want fellowship sinners. But he saw in his eternal purpose one act of grace. Amen. He gathered them up. But <laughs> he expelled them. East of Eden. Now I'm telling you, brothers, that wasn't any upscale neighborhood. 
That's where the curses kicked in. And on the wrong side of the tracks, you know. Oh, I must tell you this. Clara and my granddaughter, who was 20, had come to help Clara work the garden. Hot, miserable, just like it has been. They were over there killing squash bugs on their hands and knees, sweat pouring off of them. I said, y'all live in East of Eden, aren't you? (laughs) My granddaughter's eyes got big. Clara knew what I was talking about. Not a good neighborhood. Man was distanced from God. Second thing, man became ignorant of God in that calamity. Like how soon they forget. Oh, they didn't forget there was a God. They just forgot who God really was. Oh, they, oh, there is no living being that doesn't have a God. That he conjures up from his own imagination. But you see, when your mind is depraved and your will is off kelter and your emotions are blown to bits and you project out who your God is, the best man could do is wind up with Baal, Moloch, Mammon, or some derivative of him. Utter tragedy. Utter man become ignorant of God. And thirdly, man become unlike God in sin. That is to say, creation's image was severely distorted. But I want you to contemplate how perfectly God has responded in this, in his provided redemption through Jesus. Man was restored to God by Christ. No longer distance from him. I'll have more to say about that. Man now knows God through Jesus. While we have the mind of Christ, why can't we know the Father? Man is made like God in Christ. That is, our image of God is being restored. Now first, let's let's consider this just a moment. Man was restored to God by Christ. See, he was distanced. I tell you, it's a long ways from east of Eden to God. <laughs> but, but now he's restored. In the resurrection and ascension of Jesus is proof that God accepted him as the one who perfectly fulfilled the divine objective of creation, God's perfect man. So, in the resur- but in the resurrection of Jesus, that forever condemned Adam's race. See, not only did he accept the new race, Adam's race is written off now. that's, That's over, over and done. The acceptance in heaven of Jesus, God accepted him and all he stood for, or all that is in him, we might put it that way. As man is joined to Christ, he's restored to God because Jesus is at God's right hand. It's just that simple. Now, of course, man's judicial restoration is called justification. Amen. He was delivered up for our transgressions and resurrected for our justification. Amen. Okay. Amen. Now, that's Sometimes, you know, I'm out working and your mind gets to wondering and I love figures of speech and every now and then I, I d- develop a few of my own which collapse <laughs> when carried to extremes, but all figures really do. 
But I imagine myself, and you may want to imagine yourself being in Jerusalem when they crucified our Savior. You're ignorant. You've just come to town. You don't live there. You're just a passing through. And you see crucifixion. But there were three. You don't know what's going on. You turn around. God provides an angel unawares. He says, why are they on the cross? He responds to me, two on either side. They're bad sinners, thieves. They needed crucifixion. But how about the one in the middle? He says, because you are a sinner. Because you are a sinner. It saddens me to think about it. But three days later, I'm coming back to town. I know this kind of where the metaphor kind of breaks down but a little bit, but I see Jesus walking with his disciples. That's where it breaks down. But he's out of the grave. I turn around and there's my informant. He says, he was crucified for me. Why is he out of the ground? Because you're justified. Hallelujah. Three days. <laughs> now you know again in the twinkle of an eye, it's going to not, take long when the final is over to return and glorify you. See? Oh, I, I'm a simple man. I like to think of salvation, which is not simple, but that I can grasp it into three parts, justification, sanctification, glorification. That is, that's what God has to unjustify. That God's going to do, glorify. But what's he doing today? Sanctifying you. That needs a high priest. That's my point. I remember when we were kids, we was always arguing about salvation. That bunch over yonder is always telling you about they had been saved, and that's it. And we're always retarting. Well, no, we're going to be saved. <laughs> Both of us off base. We ought to have been talking about sanctification. What, what's God doing now? And we, that's his high priest function. And since we don't talk about much what he's doing now in some circles, we don't know much about the high priest. Now, in the death that he died not due, there's a value accrued. See, it wasn't due, so there's offered anyway, a value accrued for all that will accept it. Justified humanity can now draw near. Amen. A sinner standing in Jesus is no longer a sinner. He's a saint. Amen. Boy, I go from saint to sinner there. Not guilty. That's canceled. Any reason, every reason for separation is removed. Neither heaven, hell, nor earth can condemn the trusting one in Jesus. Every claim fully met. I had a another picture come before me of God asking me, now before you can come in, I want to check and see what you know. I says, Father, your son, Jesus, is my wisdom. Well, I just need to see if we can kind of justify you being here. Father, your son, Jesus, is my justification. Well, I want to kind of see if you cleaned up your life 
Father, pardon me, but your Son is my sanctification. Do you deserve a glorified body? Father, one last time, your Son is my redemption. He is made unto us wisdom, justification, sanctification, redemption. Now here's the paradox. If you have that hope in you, you'll purify yourself. My ability and inability, I should say, is overcome in his ability. Amen. I'm restored to the possibilities of my nature. A new vital union with God is introduced. In him, Jesus, can we boast more blessings than Adam lost? God in Christ shared human life. Man in Christ shares divine life. Amen. I have returned to the Yahweh of Judah. Rejecting man, Adam's race, God enthroned Jesus, the second man. Rejecting myself, I enthroned Jesus. Amen. Now the divine and me are going in the same direction. Amen. I have returned. God and man meet in Jesus. Restored judicially, no condemnation. Restored vitally, no separation. Restored governmentally, no alienation. Amen. Now how about this ignorance that came upon us in that garden as we were expelled I have to remind nearly anyone that I talk to that we are and were created for God's glory. But that's got to mean something, and I think you know what it means, essentially, to know God, to fellowship God, and to joyfully react to that blessed situation. <laughs> if you're, by the way, if you have no joy in your heart, you're not bringing God glory, I'll tell you that right now. You're created to be conscious of Him, in communion with Him, and in cooperation with Him. Now, all that was lost in Adam and all restored in Jesus. In Jesus, God provides himself a means of self-revelation in a man. Amen. Now, <laughs> I can just see Isaiah in the book of Isaiah, God coming to his son and like, Son, the heavens declare my glory, but no one's seeing my love. Son, the law's showing my justice, but no one's seeing my mercy. Son, you got to go. God's self revelation. Or Jesus Christ. To see Jesus is to see God, and you will not and cannot see and know God any other way. I'm telling you, any other attempt will lead you to Baal, it'll lead you to Mammon, or it'll lead you to Moloch, or a jillion other man created gods. Now, as some of the other brothers mentioned, the Holy Spirit gets caught up in all of these things. But you've got to remember, the Holy Spirit is going to teach all things. He's going to bring in remembrance, Jesus said, of what I said to you. 
So the work of the Holy Spirit is to focus it back on Jesus. Bear witness of Jesus, glorify Jesus, on and on and on. So in summation, the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus, yes, but Jesus reveals the Father. Thus, we know the Father. Now, sin, and that really worked on the mind, and it worked on the emotion, and it worked on our will. Jesus dealing with these problems through his death and his high priesthood cleanses these things. That's restoring the soul. Seeing Jesus, when you see Jesus with a sound mind, an emotion operating from love, and a will in agreement with God's purpose and will, creates an environment that you can know God. And when you know Him, worship breaks out. You want to plan a worship service? (laughs) You better plan on knowing God. Then God will light the fire. You talked about that uh, profane fire, uh, common fire, man's own design to worship God. God won't have it. But you glorify the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you back to God Worship breaks out and you'll serve humanity. Now, restored to God, we still project from man who God is. But rather than projecting from me, (laughs) I'll project from the man, Jesus Christ. He is the gateway through which my mind forms a concept of God, which immediately arrests, subdues, and commands the loyalty of my life. Then I can say, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for Him, and He'll save us. This is Jehovah. We've waited for Him, and we will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Thus in Jesus, man is restored to God. Now finally, my last point. Man, his image was distorted when he fell. That image was put to the test. That is being restored. Man contrasted to any other part of civilization or any other part of creation was created in God's image as a medium of divine manifestation. It does it better than nature. It does it better than the heavens, the sun, stars, and moon. It does it better than law. It does. God wanted to reveal himself in man. That's the reason he was created in his image. Now, redemption certainly is incomplete until that image is totally restored. That's the reason redemption is not Complete because it is being restored and will be finally restored in glorification. Now that's the, to me, really the ultimate issue of the work of Christ in man now as high priest. The first fact of redemption in that restoring you to God, that was perfected in your justification. But this second the restoring of knowing God is being perfected through sanctification, but this third one of the glorification is going to be the third appearing. Without reference to the first two, justification be over, sanctification is over, now glorification. Now John establishes the accomplishment of our fellowship. Now are we the children of God and we know that if he shall appear and he will, we shall be like him. 
Amen. That's the complete restoration. Amen. Everyone that had his hope set on him purified himself, of course. Therefore, as Christ is the express image of the Father, because Christ will fulfill the primordial, primal divine purpose restored to the image and the likeness of God, so shall we be in him. Jesus, as the revelation of God, to the extent that you are Christ-like, dare I say that you are God-like in his image. Zechariah, John's father, you know, he was, <laughs> he tongue kind of tied up there for a while, as you well know. Boy, did he not explode when he got it back? I mean, he, he let loose with a gospel sermon. Amongst that, he said that salvation was in order, that we become holy and good. Now, I, I like to, when I see the word salvation, I always like to say, now, is that justification, or is that sanctification, or is that glorification, or is that all three, or is that a combination of two? And it's helpful here I like to say, when John said that salvation was in order that we become holy and good, justification, that taken care of, now you can become holy and good, which is sanctification and the high priest's job. But that carried on eventually leads to glorification. As you might say, you're cleaning up the alive. Now, the work of Christ then is that we should be holy and good. High priest work. See, justifications, uh, judges declare. Holy, uh, the sanctification is high priest work. Now, holiness is character. Goodness is conduct. Conduct comes from character. So let's think of God's character. Holy, holy, holy. Then what would you expect his conduct to be? <laughs> Always righteous. <laughs> uh, every time. Now Jesus was that express image. Amen. So you would think that Jesus' character and conduct would mirror God's. And it did. Now Jesus gives us his life to us if you'll crucify your old one and you're subdued in love and obedience, given a new heart and a new spirit, and from this new nature arises holiness of character and righteousness of conduct. Therefore, you are having your image restored like God in Christ. Accepting the life of Christ, Christ lives in you. Your intelligence, which was debased, is now able to see matters clearly, value them accordingly. The mind now apprehends with the mind of Christ. The degraded emotion that caused people to literally as an act of religion, burn their children in the fires of Moloch, operates now with their affection set on things above. The unruly will gained in Adam, rather than rebelling, elects to act under the compulsion of the throne in joyful acceptance. I'll leave you with this. The redemption in Christ that we have will finally make you a revelation of God. Yes. All the glorious fullness of deity will have its perfect outshining. It has had a perfect outshining in Jesus. But in his high priest capacity, he is preparing you and making it possible for the final realization of the race to be that 
perfect outshining of God. Amen. Praise God Amen. that even in earth's decline, you can in his image shine. Amen. Unto him that loved us and loosed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom and to be priest unto God the Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen.